Hi there, and welcome to another episode of the Creative Endeavor podcast. I'm actually coming to you from my house here in Lawrence in New Zealand, and it just started snowing outside, so I'm itching to get out there and get some photographic reference. But before I do, I want to share with you this interview. Now, in this episode, I'm bringing you an interview with Jacob Butler, who's a young artist based in Fremantle in Western Australia. Now, I've actually known Jacob for a few years, and I find his personal story so inspiring. Jacob, like many people, received some negative feedback when he was very young, and this ultimately destroyed any future that he hoped to have with his creative passion. Fortunately, Jacob picked it up again later in life and found himself dominating within his niche, now making a really comfortable living selling his paintings full time. And this is the point of the creative endeavor, bringing you inspiring stories from creative professionals from around the world. I really enjoyed this conversation with Jacob and I hope you will too. Without further ado, here's Jacob Butler. Jacob Butler, it is fantastic to finally have you on the podcast. Let's just, let's take people back a little bit because you and I go back a little ways here and I've known you and known of you for a few years. We, we first met at a workshop probably about five or six years ago. Um, and that, that's when you first told me your story and you were just kind of coming up then. But over the years, I've watched you kind of develop as an artist and you've had a bit of an unusual track. Why don't you kick us off and tell us a little bit about your story and what brought you up to this point where you're at now? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll try and keep it as um, as brief as possible because I can go on for a while. But No, I'm no, we, we not... want the long version, Jacob. Oh, okay. All right, cool. <laughs> um, well, I, st- I started off like probably yourself, um, just, just drawing everything that I could see. Um, it was just my favorite thing to do especially I was living in rural um, Western Australia, like on the, in the gold fields and these little mining towns. Mm. Um, yeah, there was basically no TV, so we used to walk around the bush collecting things, and I always just used to have a pencil and, uh, and paper, and I'd just draw everything that I saw, um, kangaroos, emus. My dad's – he had a lot of mates with big trucks. So I used to draw them as they came in and just um, really found it was like an escape, like a – in hindsight, it was like a meditation, like it just made me feel good. Hmm. Um, and then I guess as you, I did a couple of things when I was four years old or I think when we moved to Kalgoorlie, some of the stuff used to get into the, like into the newspaper and the little sort of um, little sections in the school to say, you know, well done with your art. But um, as I got older, I think we, we basically moved to Italy at the age of 12. Hmm. Oh, sorry, at the age of eight. Um, art just sort of went out the window a bit. Right, right. It was just, I think, I think ever ever since I was young, I wanted to be an artist, but I'd always have these situations where I'd always listen to people's feedback. And there was a couple of moments where I remember saying, oh, you, or hearing your son's great artist. Um, is he going to be an artist when he grows up? But it was always, what, what, what sticks in, into my mind was there's no money in it. And, um, yeah. Yeah, I think so, but there was but there was just no point. There was always just something that sort of stopped me from breaking through, so it just it lost importance as I got older and I got more interested in video games and yeah. movies and just crap. Um and then fast forward basically well actually sorry, while I was in Italy, that's sort of when I used it as a bit of like a saving grace because mm. I was living in Italy in a classroom where everything was Italian, so I had to sort of communicate with people or even really it was more about getting people to like me um and i knew that i had that special skill that i could draw so i used to draw the teacher and draw students and stuff and like pass them the piece of paper you know and say check it out <laughs> so it's, it sort of made me feel like i had something special going um and then once again sort of uh fast forward to move back to australia and i was in high school and it became less important as i sort of had to start again in high school didn't know anybody, had to make friends again. Um, and, yeah, I think I had a teacher in year nine where all I, all I really – I was just self-taught the whole time, drawing pencils, recreating sort of like Michelangelo sculptures and I liked the old Roman stuff. Oh, wow. Cool. And I did this, 
do this big drawing and hand it in to the teacher who was a bit nutty, I thought. And she, um, she got lipstick and, and basically painted over this pencil drawing and said, no, nah, it's sort of, it's not, it's not current enough. You need to make it more contemporary. And that's sort of when I just threw in the towel. Like I just had a hizzy fit and basically just. Sorry. Whoa, 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 whoa. St- hang on a second. You, you, how old were you at this point when you gave that drawing to her? Uh, 14. For your, so you're 14 years old. You're proud of this drawing. You take it to your teacher. She draws on it with lipstick. Yeah, she got lipstick and just sort of went, no, you got to. It was just like it wasn't in her paradigm of what was good art and it took me forever. People liked it. I liked it. And then it was just another crossroad where it was like, art's not, wow. you're not good enough. Art, art's not the right answer. Um, go study something else. And then finally the art teacher said, no, nah, you know, wrong direction. So it was sort of like the nail in the coffin for me. Yeah, wow. Um, and it was since that day, I think it was year nine, where I basically completely stopped it. Like it just, I think I, t- I did another another drawing then about probably 10 years ago when I was working on a ship. But the thing was is that um, I was really lost, you know, for those years from, mm. from uh, I think like most people when you go to school, you think that you know what you're going to be, but by the time year 12 comes around, you get the marks and you still don't really, you know, you're still, I, I just never had a correct pathway because I was always, yeah. Uh, up in odds as to what to do. So um, I did all sorts of jobs. I was working on mine sites. Um, I was working at bars and cafes. And I just sort of hit a dead end uh, everywhere I went um, and basically got to work on yachts where I thought I'd start start a new career, basically. Mm. I love traveling because I, I grew up in Italy um, and started working on the super yacht industry for about three or four years, but that turned out, basically I got the sack from the job and had to start over again. So it, like everywhere I went was a dead end. Yeah. I, th- I think I drew the, I think while on board, I pulled out, uh, I, I was reading Charles Bukowski, old poets and stuff. I was mm-hmm. sort of always interested in, in people who's a bit like me, never found their way and did a drawing of him. I think that was, that was probably, a, a drawing I picked up after 10 years and once again I was like wow this is really good I love this but I still had didn't have the time to, to do it yeah yeah so after that I thought okay now I'm 25 and I'm, I felt like I've wasted 10 years seeking and not finding anything and I'm sort of rock bottom again because I'm living with my mum and have no job or prospect even though I was happier um, because I had some great experiences and I thought well Maybe I'll start working boats because that's where the money is. That's where the money is to me. If if it wasn't going to be art, um, then I'll just find something that that pays well. Hmm. Um, one other thing I should say is that I did try architecture, and the only reason why I did architecture was because I got the marks for it, hmm. and because it was the only degree I thought that you could actually do drawing. No. And one thing is my name is my nickname's shaky because my hands shake especially sort of when i'm doing something or chatting to people or nervous or all the above yeah yeah and with architectural drawings you have to be very fine with your lines you have to yeah. you know what i mean everything needs to be accurate and that's something i was terrible at yeah so the only reason why i did the art the architecture was to do art and the university lecturer said that i need to go work my art skills so i was like right no good for me then as well you know it was just another kicking the guts. Wow. Um, yeah. So, so that's sort of like how it led me into, into doing artwork. What happened was I started off, uh, I didn't know where I was going to go and then somebody said, why don't you get a job on the wharf? It's high paying and it's sort of related to your industry. It's in boats and I, and I basically put a resume in this in one morning. Uh, the very next morning, this, this lady told me about it and it turns out I was and it's no joke, I was the last person to put in this um, resume and there was over 10,000 applicants for it, like all around Australia and New Zealand. Wow. And it was, this, it was this job which was ridiculously high paid and it was week on, week off. It was like a job that never happens. It's sort of, it was for the Gorgon Project. And oh, it was basically, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So highly paid, working sort of under Chevron, didn't need any skills. Um, but I'd have all the time in the world to do whatever I wanted week on, week off. So I was like, wow, I've sort of just hit the jackpot after getting the sack. So things are looking up. And I got this job and I was just in this 
like seen with all these people who've been working their asses off to get a job like that, like riggers, uh, people in mining industries, construction, mm. big burly men from all backgrounds. There was, there was people in gangs. There was people, ex-criminals, ex-football players. Um, but it was awesome. It was all people that I just find really fascinated. Books I read about, just I was like, man, this is this is awesome. But I just felt like there was, I just did not belong here. You know, I just I was there for a ride. So working the job, I think it was after a couple of months. I was like, now I'm getting paid really well, and I'm just wasting money like nothing. Hmm. I, I basically I was living this shadow of a person where I still had no um, no like no direction and mm-hmm. no purpose mm-hmm. and one day i was sitting i was sitting on the work bus and this guy goes well i think for some reason i just started picking up a pen and i was drawing one of the guys in the bus for the first time i've done it in ages because it was raining and when you when it rains in the wharf you don't work oh wow it's stop it's stop work so uh, i was sitting on this bus and this guy goes man that's pretty good can you do a drawing for me on my helmet and i think it was a boxer the guys are like an xbox a big big dude and and I painted, uh, I did a drawing of Mike Tyson with, with black marker. Yep. And he was like, man, that, that's, that's really good because he could put it on his hat and all of a sudden everyone knew he was a boxer. Yeah. And, uh, and then from there, it went to this guy uh, because they're all sort of union. Um, somebody like Shea Guevara drew him. And then I got another request, another request. And all of a sudden, I'm like, man, this is great. I'm drawing, I'm enjoying it, I'm offering something to the world and I'm getting better. Mm. And I always thought that using color was really hard. Um, that was a probably a big fear and why I didn't launch into art because I was too scared to think, man, color's hard. I can draw, but color's just another world. Mm. But when I realized that if I could just change the boxing glove to a red, you know, use a paint pen and fill that in, then really it's just drawing. You're just using a different color and it was easy. Mm. So, so pretty soon, I'd, that's all I used to do. I'd basically be known as the guy who paints helmets. And the people on the wharf loved it so much that they used to hire me in a bus or the van. And you get other guys in a van who drive around and drop these helmets off. And I'd just be sitting there. I basically set up a studio on the wharf. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> and, it, and it was seriously mind blowing. Like people couldn't believe what was happening that I was getting paid to draw. But at the end of the day, everybody wanted a helmet. Mm. So they didn't really care. So if I was under their crew, they'd put me in the van. And I just draw helmets for him, and then I was like, "Wow, this is not only fun; it's hilarious." Because now you've got all these big burly men, and everyone's got like a, everyone's got their pride in drawing their hat. Could have been their dog, or their girlfriend, or their wife, or their footy team, or whatever. But it was just like a sea of colour up on the wharf. Oh wow! Yeah. Um, so from there, I was like, uh, one day I was, I, I started getting to sketching because I got my confidence up, hmm. and um, started bit by bit getting all these new different pens and, 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 and sort of like uh, tools where I can create better, better pictures. And um, the, the actual boss of Patrick, which is the company I used to work for, and the, the other guy in charge basically walked into this area. It was the washdown bay. And I was sitting there um, basically with this kit. There was a couple of guys sort of guarding me because I was doing a drawing for him. And he's like, Shaky, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and um, and I had like I was covered in paint. I had I had this scene. I go, I'm drawing pictures. Have a look. And I thought I was going to get the sack like right there. And he's like, check this out. He goes, oh, I want to see you in my office. And I was thinking, all right, that's it for me. You know, I sort of push it too hard. It was when good while it lasted. Office, <laughs> when I get to the office, he goes, you know what? That's really good. I actually want to uh, commission you to do a calendar for the wharf. I want you to paint every one of the wharf, and you can do it on the job. True. And I was like, man. Now I've actually got, now I've got a, um, a license to paint by the boss and also by the union who I was doing all this work for as well. And instead of doing a 12-page calendar, I knew I had about nine months left, I turned it into a 120-page calendar. And I basically painted about 100, 100 portraits and 110 helmets for, like, for the whole duration. So I just pushed it as far as I could. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was awesome. You know, like all of a sudden my whole world opened up. Like mm. I was happy. I was actually offering something because I knew like I was falling asleep when I was actually doing actual proper wharf work. Mm. I remember dogging a crane and that was this giant cement block, hundred kilos or something. No, it would have been two tons. And I was, I was basically falling asleep as I was doing the dogging, dogging work. It was just, I was just never wired for it, you know, but as yeah. soon as I 
drew and um, saw people's reactions, like my whole world changed. And I, I, and I thought there and then, that's just, that's me. That's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Hmm. There was this guy called Bay Rigby and his hmm. dad was Paul Rigby. And he was a world famous cartoonist. Um, and I used to hang out with him a bit prior to working on the wharf. And I just realized like, I always thought that what he could do with his pencil where you could summarize somebody or do a drawing um, really quick in so little lines, I actually thought it was like a form of magic because yeah. he'd be able to mm. sort of summarize somebody or do something either good or bad and basically that was them on paper sort of yeah. manifested. Mm. I thought it was like magic. And then not only that, the power that he received through working for the newspapers um, and basically he would have the ability to, to cause – um, to sway people's opinions politically or socially just based on what cartoons he did. And I thought yeah. there's just power to it as well, you know. Like yeah, yeah. You, have, you have the power to shape the world if you, if you put all your heart into it. So that mm. was the first sort of feeling I thought when I was doing it in the war where I, all of a sudden there's a sea of hats. I'm, I'm, you know, it, it just everything clicked for me. So mm. once that job finished, I thought there's no way I could ever work another job in my life again apart from this. And I just sort of kept following, following the direction, kept going forward. Wow. So, I mean, it, it, it ruined you, <laughs> essentially. Because, yeah. I mean, yeah. I always thought that, you know, I, I, I said from the get-go, like I, I was a serial fiery. I, I, I don't know if I've ever talked about this on the podcast um, or in any video, but I was fired from just about every job that I ever had. So I thought, you know, yeah. if, I, if I couldn't make this work, then, you know... Um, then then I'm done, you know, but it, it does. Once you start doing this, the thought of, of going back to having to work for somebody else, not that there's any shame in it, not that there's anything wrong in it, with it, but it's just once you've experienced that, you're, you're engaged in your, your passion and you're now deriving an income from it, you know, then that's the sort of thing that really it invigorates you, you know, and, and you, you have this, this almost boundless energy, not to say you don't get tired sometimes, but you always seem to be able to summon something to just go the extra mile. When, if you're doing something outside of your wheelhouse or outside of your values, then maybe, maybe not so much, but that's, that's inspiring, man. That's inspiring because when I think of you and I think of your work, cause I, I'm following you on Instagram, been following you on for, for ages, ever since I got Instagram and I, I'm watching some of these more recent posts, maybe over the last couple of years, of what you're doing now. And that's going to take some energy. I want you to maybe tell people a little bit about what you do now, because I think it's one of the coolest ways of taking your talent and your passion and sharing it with people. Like sometimes on the most momentous day of their lives or the most momentous occasion, and you're immortalizing this, but you're doing it live. Like, I, t t I don't want to give it away. Tell, tell people, like, what, what, what that's all about. Yeah, well, what, I guess when I was working the wharf, I thought, I'm going to paint helmets. And then it just sort of kept moving forward and forward and kept evolving from big walls to mm. I started. I think what happened was when I started painting, I thought, I, I really, because I'm that I only started recently, like six years ago. I thought I'm so behind with um, with all the other artists who have been practicing, and I, and I want to pursue this. I want to be really good. So I I thought I really got to throw myself in the deep end and just to force myself to sort of learn or do something a lot a lot quicker and and the hard route. So um, I think when I was painting on the wharf it was always on the company time as well and I was doing it in a van and I only had about half an hour to to do a drawing so I was always doing under pressure with people watching me and it to me you you reach a zone where when there's a time limit you can sort of feel yourself in a zone where stuff is just coming out freely it's not even really you thinking about it it just becomes an automatic process yeah and I guess it two or three years later after doing paintings uh, for galas and things for charity events, we, we realized, I met my wife, Anne, she's a wedding photographer, and her, her job is all about photographing people at weddings, but really capturing their day and the essence of the, of the love. Um, and we managed to get a, a, basically Anne was tasked with photographing a couple who were famous, um, Robbie Gray is a 
well, he's a famous football player. He's a le- legend of a guy, but the job was in Melbourne. With uh, he was marrying Annabelle. It's really, they're a beautiful couple, and I was just um, fresh off the wharf. And we basically thought, no, we've got to get the big guns there. So we've got a, a wedding photographer in Melbourne to help out Ange. But we're thinking, well, how can I sort of be part of this process? So hmm. uh, let's bring an easel to the wedding and see what happens. And basically, as Ange was photographing their day, I had a little pocket camera and decided to take a photo of them during the reception, uh, during the ceremony. It was the first kiss. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, you know, that would make a pretty good painting. So I had an easel and, uh, and a canvas and didn't even really thought, think about what was going to happen or what was going to be painted. But I just knew there and then I probably could pull it off in about three or four hours. Mm-hmm. So I set up the easel and started painting i had a time lapse ready which helps with the pressure which i think forced me to produce and people just started coming in and gawking over it just going you know like how did this all happen um and i go through my same method where it's the pressure that actually that i feed off the energy in the room so i always have these big headphones on uh where i play sort of a just music that's really energetic and I basically get into this trance like state where I can just paint to the beat Mm -hmm. and I always figure if you could never actually think about anything and just do something on impulse or instinct then it should be easy and to me it was easy because I just had this music to go with the flow and basically painted them um, on their wedding day in front of everyone at the whole reception and they just really loved it Um, and I I didn't really know what like the gravity of it all that that day either. I was just like, to me, it's just a big adrenaline rush. And when I'm finished, I just want to, you know, grab a beer and relax because I'm I'm spent after. It's like running a race. Um, but they, Robbie put it on his Instagram. So did Annabelle. And then all of a sudden, the next day, it was, can you paint in Adelaide? Can you paint in Melbourne? Can you paint in Sydney? Can you paint in Perth? Every, everybody wanted a, a wedding painting. It just happened overnight. Wow. Um. Mm. And that's what I've been doing for the last year and a half. And it's, it's just perfect. Like the whole, the whole setup is perfect. It's like I'm, I'm sort of designed for it because mm. there's a huge amount of pressure, but I'm really fascinated in people. I, I always want to capture people. So why not better doing capturing people at their most, you know, at their best and mm. also showing that love on their wedding day and also having Ange beside me getting the right photographs so we can actually put them in the right light um, and do it on the spot. It's, um, yeah, it's something pretty special. That's fantastic, man. That's fantastic. You know, I love that thing as well. Like you're, to be thrown in, in the mix with all of those people and all those prying eyes, like you are, you're building yourself up, it sounds like, to, to be able to withstand any amount of pressure or criticism. But can you tell me like, do you, have you? I I know people have been for the most part, uh, you know, positive. But how do you deal with criticism? Maybe even like the critic in your mind. I, this is a thing, I, and I'm always curious when I talk to other artists, right? Because we we really um, we give ourselves a hard time. We let other others give us a, us a hard time as well. And we seem to wear this stuff. We take it personally when we say it to ourselves. We take it personally when we hear it from somebody, uh, whether they're well-meaning or not. And it seems to affect us. Have you just shelved that altogether? Have you just put that completely out of your mind? Or if not, how do you deal with that? Oh, it's, 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 uh, I hear the craziest comments, you know, when I'm painting. Um, like, first of all, like, like I was saying, when I start the painting, I, I literally, like, the eyes roll back in the, the back of my head and I have this music on it and I sort of get into a trance like state and like nothing is around me. I just, yeah. I feel people there, but I don't see them. Yeah. And I just know in my head that at the end of the day, it's, it has to be done no matter what, you know, like yeah. I sort of, I, I, I manifest in my own brain that this is going to be the result of the painting and everyone's going to be happy. Yeah. So the thing is, is that I go through a roller coaster of a ride every single time I paint. It, it's, it's like, a mix between extreme fear and like extreme elation when I'm getting that ecstatic flow state. Hmm. Um, and I just do my, I just sort of know in myself that I can pull it off, you know? And there's a lot of times where it's just going so bad or the proportions out or it's too big. And then, um, th- I think 
the the only way the only reason why I can do it fast as well is because I just try not to think about the mistakes. I, like everything is a building block, so I'll use a big brush and and if I stuffed it up, just start again. You know, I'm basically constantly starting again as I'm yeah. painting it. Um, and then I'll use a head. I'll use my headphones, and then sometimes I'll sort of pull them off, and I'll hear somebody say, "Oh, that's brilliant." And then other times it's like, "Yeah, I don't know about her," or I'll just oh. hear these little comments, <laughs> and it, ha- it happens all the time, and I hear some crazy comments. So I'll just sort of use that as a bit of a gauge. You know, I'm like, "Okay, how's this bearing?" And I'll just sort of listen to something. All right, back on, back to work. But uh, I really take criticism bad, you know. So at the at the end of my at the end of the day, I know that I can do a better job when I take it back to the studio, although I try and finish it on the day. I just mm. have to block it out. Yeah. Um, and it's a bit like like everything is a process. That's the hard part with the paintings is that when you're mid-stroke building up a female portrait of a face, then I, I work from dark to light. Quite mm. often they just look terrible because you you're doing expression before, you know, with a squiggly line before their face emerges. Yeah. So... um. I find it impossible to leave um, as I'm doing that. So I'll literally paint for five to six hours straight without moving sometimes, mm. like hunched over. I've just got to do it. And I think yeah. the fact the fact that people see how dedicated I am, they sort of just leave me alone. You know, um, they're, they're like, well, you know, he's trying. <laughs> <laughs> but look, you also, like, you don't just paint live uh, people's, you know, you know, weddings and, and also events and things. You, you do your fair share of studio painting as well, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, that's the, the that's the balance I'm trying to work out at the moment because hmm. to me, when you do a portrait, really, it's if you're doing it right, it's a flow state and it's sort of you're taking in whatever vibration you see them at and you're reproducing it on canvas. So you're sort of filtering their person um through for yourself mm. so i the tricky thing about a wedding is that you're always doing it based on that that person um but i've got a hell of a lot of ideas that i want to do as well where i can just pick pick something or a subject and i want to do it big and large with that same style mm. um i've just been so busy with with weddings the last two years where i've sort of got to give myself um a bit of time and make sure that I, I can focus on, on that as well. Hmm. Um, the, probably the, the my favourite one I did recently was of a uh, Aboriginal elder, and it was just a photo that it was it was through a couple of photos that I took, but th- that I didn't take that I that I saw. Sorry, and it was just this sort of mystic, it was like a mystic. Um, I called it "Enter the Mystic," and I always think that like everyone's got a bit of magic inside them and especially witch doctors and things like that or old mystical men I'm really drawn to and I really wanted to sort of capture that that being um without getting like a like an exact representation so it was like through a flow state and the end result was just him sort of looking at you looking at your yourself Mm. um like a mixture of abstract and semi-realism like that that's what I want to that's what I want to get to fantastic Fantastic. Yeah. It's like artwork that kind of occupies both those worlds and it's hard to kind of tie down and, and pin down exactly what it is. I've seen, I've seen that image because you posted that, haven't you, on your Instagram? Yeah. And it was just, yeah. it's it's a thing, you know, like it, it took me three hours to do, but I can't, three I can't hours. do that. In yeah. Basically wow. I did it in, in, and I can't really do that in, in one sitting if I'm in a studio uh, with the lights and everything and I'm, I'm all set up. It has to happen in that state. Yeah. And yeah, it's just like a like I was saying. I think if you, if you're in the right moment and you can do something that comes from within and you're not thinking about anything, then that's you know that's that's your uh, that's yeah. the free flow yeah. uh, that I want to do more of. But uh, I just think it's important for me um, to wait until I get my own photos of people and my own reference shots before I do any more. So that's the plan this year. Yeah, cool, cool. You know, it's it's interesting because I. Finding that flow state, finding that place where you, where the ideas start coming to you and, and, and you, you just feel, well, maybe not so much the ideas coming to you, but maybe more the, you feel that, that connection, that seamless connection with what you're, what you're engaged in. That's something that 
I've struggled with myself, you know, on and off, you know, over the years. And I, I have trouble working out what gets me into that state. And, and having looked at um, into personal development and things and people like Tony Robbins, he always talks about controlling your state in order to become, you know, most effective at what it is that you're doing and getting yourself out of states as well. It's very handy for that. And I, I have trouble putting my finger on it for myself, to be honest. Sometimes I find that I'm in the zone and I'm able to paint for hours and hours and hours. Mm. Other days, I will still put in the hours and I'll still just grind it out, but I won't be in the zone. And, and it's, like, it's like chewing on the painting. It's like, it's, it's tough. You got to get through it, you know, and it's just slowly just cranking along. Maybe I need to take a leaf from your book and start listening to some like fat beats or something in my like in my <laughs> earphones instead of listening to uh, conspiracy theory videos in the news. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I do a bit the same. I listen to like a Joe Rogan podcast and I sort of yeah. follow a, a series of um, self-help people or inspirational people like Jocko Willink and um, David Goggins and yeah. and uh, I just find it just like I'm listening to it and I'm distracting, but I'm I'm in autopilot, but not actually in the room. Yeah. Um, so, but no, I, I, I have the same thing all the time as well, um, where I'll have a painting and I just want to touch it up mm. and I've, all of a sudden I've spent 15 hours on it and then I'm angry and I'll rub it out and start again. Whereas if wow. I was in that mode and if I sort of was one with the painting and I just need to do a couple of alterations and mm. then you're right. So, um, I think the, there's, I guess it depends, you know, like when, you do, when you're doing it, um, yeah, when, when the thoughts start coming and you feel like it's all easy and you're sort of creating on the go, that comes in waves, I find. Um, and then I was chatting to this guy who's a, last year we followed this guy and his mate who trained up five camels and they walked into the canning stock route. They walked the desert for 40 days. So that was a project we, we followed him around with. And he was a severe, like, marathon runner. He, he's done everything. Wow. Um, marathon in antarctica and he was talking about the flow state as well and he was saying it's like a you need to have a um a certain amount of risk involved so for me it's everyone's watching and and a certain amount of immediacy you know like you've got a timeline as well and then some cer certain triggers so like a music i think is a trigger for me mm. where it's like okay headsets on now get to work mm. um but like i said i can't really turn it on at will it's just it's something that happens and sometimes it doesn't when I'm in the studio anyway. You know, you and I are, are very lucky. We're, we're kind of in the same situation in a way because I work very closely with my wife, Rachel, um, who is the brains behind the operation, really. Yeah. Uh, she helps me with the business side of things. Um, she does keep me on track and keep me organized and allows me, frees me up and allows me and, and opens this space up for me to just express myself and be creative and do the things that I really love to do. I mean, she's amazing. You know, you've got something similar where you're, you're working now with your wife and you have been working for some time. And, you know, she's a very talented photographer. I'm following her too on Instagram. Love her work. Um, how, how do you find that? I mean, how lucky are we to be able to work with our significant others? It's pretty cool. Oh, no, for sure. And, like, even finding her, to me, it was the ultimate, you know, the ultimate partner as well. She was a photographer running her own business. She was literally the first artist that I met who ran her own business, you know, and survived as an artist. So um, I just thought, well, um, the more we can collaborate and my ideal life would just be combining our two passions together and seeing how we can push that further. So, um especially expecting a, a child in, in July as well, it's it's just amazing to be able to actually have a team behind you, you know, probably just like yourself and your wife, like you can travel the journey together. Mm. Um, and that's what we do with weddings as well. We um, we team up and Ange does the photography and I do the artwork and it's just like it's, it's amazing to be able to sort of transition um, using two different mediums to sort of tell a story and that's what we try and do, you know, through all our endeavours, our trips, um, the our exhibitions and so on hmm. and um yeah what can i say you know just really lucky that's fantastic you know it's um it's amazing having that kind of collaboration as well with them but you know one of the things that i, I find you know on, on a personal note is that this idea of balance 
and and getting a chance to switch off. I mean, I've talked about this before in the past, but I don't know about you, but I I, I don't have a balance. I don't know what that word means. I don't know where yeah. where that exists. Like it's just it's not something that that's on my radar. It's like no, I wake up, I go to the studio, I work. You know, when it was at home, I'd just go into the studio and and keep going, and. And she's kind of the same, you know, my Rachel's kind of, kind of the same, you know, she's, she's very focused. And whenever we get time together, it's like doing something as well that is work related. So, yeah, you know, I, I don't know about, oh, no, yeah. did you ever find balance? Do you well, ever, I'm, this I'm, elusive I mean, thing? Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, it is. I mean, I'm the worst at it because I always get told to switch off and I can't, you know, especially when you get like yourself, you get emails at three in the morning from different parts of the world. Yeah. Um, and I'm always chasing that next, I'm not chasing it, but I'm always waiting for that new excitement. So I can't help but, but be drawn to the phone or, or whatever. So what we do is, um, there's certain things we do. Like for example, I paint, I don't paint at home anymore. I paint at a studio. So then I can separate home from, from, yeah. from you know, be, being on, on the game. And, um, we go to the Northcott gym every morning. So, exercise and sport has just been a huge saving grace i used to get into bodybuilding because that helped me with my confidence when i was younger and i think not only that it's like if you've got all this pent-up emotion or thoughts just letting it out at the gym or or yeah. running or whatever it may be is just a huge thing so i do that every morning or mm. you know when i can mm. and the other main thing as well is that we just always find time to do a big trip or a couple of trips a year awesome. so that so Last year was the um, – we followed two guys who trained up five camels and they did a 40-day trek into the desert. So we thought it would be a cool thing to just follow them with our photography so we can turn that to an exhibition down the track. Um, this year is going to be the Kimberley. But from what I hear as well, it doesn't matter what you've got on. It's If you go out and do something with your partner or just do something separate, go out and on an exhibition uh, expedition or to another country and ha have some – do your own thing, then that's also where inspiration comes from as well. Mm. So we always make sure we have to do that, you know. Having a big reset button and clicking that reset yeah. and, and people have their ways of doing it. I mean, for some, it's television and movies and media, which I find personally a very destructive way to reset because I think it robs yeah, from you. It yeah, and, and I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of getting into that sort of thing. And I even have to be careful about the type of music that I'm listening to as well. I'm listening yeah. now to a lot more kind of softer, you know, beats and, and like chill mixes and stuff that I find on YouTube. And I can, I'm able to kind of ride out the hours that way. And then I have to listen to people talk as well. But yeah. watching stuff now, watching stuff I have a huge problem with. So for me, a reset button, going out and being in nature is, is the biggest yeah. one for me. And artistically as well, I got to say, you know, because again, a lot of people are like, where do I find inspiration? Go for a walk, get out of your yeah. house, get out of the studio, go to the nearest nature reserve you've got, go for a walk, find nature growing through a crack in the sidewalk. If you live in a city, find something, you know, because just having these moments and going to, to just hit that reset separated from your situation can really be beneficial. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to say as well, because I, I always get told, Jake, you need a hobby. And it's like, well, not really. I love my hobbies. Paint like painting is my life, and my hobby would be painting something that I wanted to paint. You know, like yeah. it always just comes down to that. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. Sometimes you get so caught up, you need to you, you need to refresh yourself, and and it can sound weird. Like it can sound like a hard thing to do. Why would I go for a walk in the park? So I find with if you do it with someone, then that you know that's that's the trigger for me. So join a club where you train with a bunch of people, then you swim in the morning. At So I'll, I'll go to the gym at 5.30 in the morning, and then by the time we wrap up at 6.30, I'll swim in the ocean. And it's just that zap of energy that sort of shocks you into place, you know, wow. as to where you are. Yeah. Um, so that – but I don't think I could do that on my own. Like I'd have to find a partner to do it, whether it's a training buddy or you're joining a sport yeah. or something like that. Or And then uh, I guess, yeah, one other thing we do is we always go down to the farm – because I paint every day like yourself, um, going to even just shifting the environment. So we'll go down to the farmhouse and it's it's so sort of 
old school that you actually got to light a fire to have a bath. But even that whole act of like chopping wood to light the fire is awesome. Um, just shifting your environment out into, but you know, like it's not the Stone Age, but back into simpler times is just great. You know, yeah. you wake up, there's no electricity, and all of a sudden, yeah, things just become more um, more real. Can you can you tell me a little bit more about like some of these amazing experiences you've had like in WA and even across Australia that um, you know maybe you could share with people a little bit more because through what you do and also through the collaboration with your wife Ange, you guys get to see some amazing places and have incredible experiences that then come back and filter into your art. So share with us some of these uh, crazy outback adventures you've been having. <laughs> yeah, no, we certainly do, and as as I was mentioning before. Um, the, we find our best art comes from real experiences, whether it's the people we meet that touch us and sort of change us internally. They've said something and it sticks with you or um, or the landscapes that we see. That's what we want to capture with our art. So Ange will photograph it and I'll paint or vice or we'll do a collaboration. So every year, I mean, we find the city is just like, it, you know, it's like it's work a lot of the time. But we, we just need in our souls to get out in, into the bush and – I think it, it also stems from actually living in the bush. Um, I remember that I was stuck in a rut for a long time and when I when Ange basically forced me to, to drive all the way up to Broome on a camping trip, I didn't want to go at all. I was just like nothing could be worse than sitting in a car for two, for two days straight in the heat. But as soon as we left the city and it was winter and then as soon as it started becoming summer and the, the dirt started changing to like a red colour, it was just – same deal something something changed in me like a torch flickered and it reminded me of maybe where of my roots playing in the red dirt and and then all of a sudden so actually just became the um well i guess we just became so grateful for what was around us like wa is such an amazing spot the the kimberley um up north broom Wyndham. so we thought, well, every year we've got to go camping or we've got to go on a, on a trip. So we made friends with um, these people at the Diggers Rest Station, which is in between Kununurra and Wyndham, and they're basically like a bunch of um, – they've been around for about 30, 40 years, and they muster cattle, and they basically take people out in these horse treks. So every year we'd go out um, with the crew there and be their sort of uh, – photographers and artists and residents and sort of follow them along and it's and get all their footage and stuff for them because obviously they they sort of barely run on electricity let alone know how to do all the marketing so we fill that void for them and it's it's just awesome because if you're there to sort of document them then they're there to show you the best the best spots mm. so um you know to me that was living just waking up in these mosquito anti-mosquito tents and there's a Milky Way around you and you sort of like, you can hear the billy ball, there's horses in the background, you wake up at 4 a.m., the light hits you. Um, mm. You know, that's what we live for. Commoners from the city, just you just become totally helpless in the desert out there and you see these Aboriginal Australians just walking around like uh, like totally immersed in nature. It's like yeah. they are, yeah. they just, they totally become, oh, it's hard to explain, you know, like they're just... Mm. They're so sure of themselves, and they're also they also travel from over east to mm. to sort of break in the horses. And we're told that they they have like a sixth sense when it comes to horses, like they're the best best men there for the job. Wow. And just listening to to them talk, the way they talk slowly, it's like you sort of you can feel their energy, uh, people of the land, and it rubs off on you. Yeah. So they're some of the most memorable things is meeting people like that. You know, I, I spent a bit of time up in the Kimberley, um, like yourself, and, and up in the far north of WA, and had the great fortune of spending some time with a particular, you know, clan, and um, got to hang out with a law boss as well. Yeah. And hearing him talk about the land and the country, it wasn't so much that... He, I mean, he knew the names of all these plants, but he was almost, it was almost as if he was talking about plants, you know, just things on an individual basis. It's like, no, no, this tree, not this species yeah. of tree, because we're, we're very good with labels and names and classifications and separating everything. 
But to him, yeah. it was like reading, feeling, and totally, total immersion and total connection where he was part of that landscape and the landscape was part, there was no separation whatsoever. And it was, it was a really eye-opening experience for myself. You, you get around people like that and you realize that they see, they see nature and they see the environment as something completely different completely different and each other as well and um it's something i think we could use more of i I definitely you know in most most uh, you know countries today i think we could definitely use a little bit more of that connection that they show and they display um yeah it was just awesome but you know i and also just going back to to what you're saying about um you know as you're going up out of broom i I loved that you know where you'd see the the soil change i don't think people would actually appreciate just how red the earth is up there. I mean, it's more red than that door behind you. And, and if people yeah. are watching the video of this on YouTube or, you know, Jacob sitting in his uh, house at Fremantle and just behind you, there's this red door. And the, 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 the color of the soil is like literally like blood red, isn't it? Oh, no, it's amazing. And then just, um, and it changes color. Like you see colors you never really see in the city. Well, you don't, you don't see it anywhere in the world some places. Yeah. And, um, and then just how it changes, you know, from red to blue to purple, the rock, the rock formations and everything. It's like yeah. you're seeing nature for the first time up there. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where I first started seeing your paintings. And that's where at the time I was doing, working on helmets. And I was like, no, this is where I want to be. I want to, I want to get to your level. I'll stop. So that was the first. <laughs> so, well, that, that was the, you know, that's when I first saw you paint and, uh, and that's what I've always planned on doing is capturing that because yeah. it was such a life changing experience for me. Mm. That trip, I actually ended up um, proposing to Ange on the trip after that whole experience. Now we're married, we've got a kid on the way. Um, Congratulations! That I, I wanna, that's awesome. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Well, I just, I just want to. I, I think that's important to actually somehow is to sort of tell that story how important that is through your art with. Yeah. You know what I mean? Any means possible for a painting or a drawing or Yeah. You know, I think that's always been the mission. Yeah. You know, it's it's art's one of these things, you know. Um I, I said, you know, to, to my students when I first started teaching workshops, um uh, you know, like the one you came to, I, I was always always had the feeling, this really strong feeling that art was about relationships. You know, there and there were two really vital relationships. The first one was your connection with the artwork, which is always drawing upon a space or, or a place or an interaction, which then was informed by another relationship, you know, your relationship to subject, now your relationship to this thing you're creating. And then when you give birth to this piece of art, now there's another relationship again between your viewer and that artwork in which you're hands off, nothing to do with that at all. It's, it's up yeah. to your work and it's up to them if there's going to be something happening there, if they're going to respond or not. And you know, it's hearing you talk about this, I, I'm kind of reminded a little bit myself of, of my experience in the Australian wilderness. I have a similar kind of feeling here in, in New Zealand with the New Zealand oh, landscape. Yeah, it's, like, it's like getting punched in a good way. It just, it just hits you, you know? And, and, yeah. and as soon as you see it, it's like an artist kind of locks onto that, bites hold yeah. of that subject matter and just goes... I just have to say something about this. I just have to share yeah. this. I just have to, and a photo won't do, and no. and 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 maybe a video wouldn't do, or flying a drone over the. It just doesn't do. Painting it is the only thing, you know. Making your brush physically go across every nuance of that landscape or that portrait. That's the only thing that really seems to capture it for for me personally, anyway. And um, you know that that's a really important relationship there with that part of the process. And then hopefully people, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but hopefully people kind of respond to it. But um, look, I, I, have, oh, yeah, definitely. I have something else I, I wanted to ask you about um, because we, we also have done something um, quite recently for you and me and over, over the years, had the great privilege, the great fortune of being able to paint on board an extraordinary vessel. Um, do you mind talking to us a little bit about that in your recent stint oh, yeah. aboard uh, North Star Cruises, the True North? Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's always it was always a dream of mine when I was when I got sacked off the yachting industry in Europe. I was like, 
I was getting a bit – I was basically just a glorified cleaner as a deckhand, and I was thinking, you know, one day I'm going to be a guest on a boat like this um, where I can ha- have the luxury to be a guest on this, you know, this amazing vessel that's going to take you, take you places. And th- the first thing was that was a dream come true that I was like, well, now – I wasn't even painting back then. Now I'm an artist. Now I get to do it. So I thought, wow, that's pretty. That's a spin out for starters. Yeah. But the it's it's just going to be an amazing opportunity for us because the whole it's you know it's true north adventure cruises. It's like a it's an adventure boat. So it's about actually taking people to those places that we just discussed that we want to show people through our art, but actually giving them that experience. So hopefully, you know, the Kimberley or the WA rubs off on people as well, the countryside. Yeah. And 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 we basically have the opportunity in March to go on a um, trip as guests to the Kimberley Waterfalls, which I think it must be similar to what you've done because I've I've, yeah. I've got the, the King George Waterfalls in my sights. Um, that, that's gonna be that's gonna be my big painting, and awesome. it's just amazing because I've only ever seen it through uh, your artwork and a few photos that I looked at. So. Oh wow! Just, so so yeah. you you haven't been on board yet. You're you're due to go on board soon. Maybe I misread that. Yeah, no, no. So so basically, that's going to be the the big thing for us, for Ange and I. It'll be artist and resident on on the True North. But in the meantime, to sort of get get acquainted with the boat and start doing a series of of work, I've I've just spent time on the on the vessel in Sydney and Adelaide and Perth, basically as an artist and resident doing paintings of the Kim Lee scenes uh, for all the guests on board as they had functions. Mm. Um, and same deal, man. I was just looking for thousands of photos and I couldn't, I couldn't paint off anybody's photos. It had to be for the true north. I didn't want to take anyone's photos. No. And, uh, man, I was just getting itchy feet, you know. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I, was like I, gotta I can't wait to get up there and do it myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it really is going to be a dream come true because we've explored the Kim Lee but on foot – caravan horseback but we've never actually seen it through you know on a boat where you can access the, that land that mm. nobody else can unless they have you know the means to yeah yeah you know by the time this goes out um you might already be on board the vessel um so yeah oh man you're gonna have the best time you're gonna have the best time that that trip uh, I've done it twice now. Uh, that stays with you the rest of your, the rest of your life. You're, you're never going to forget that. I mean, it is it is life changing, especially for your artwork because those those landscapes. I mean, to give people an idea, Australia is a really old place. You know, it's it's it, it feels old. It looks old geologically. It's it's one of the oldest parts of the world, and those landscapes have got this really beautiful, haunting kind of feel to them where. They're so pristine and so unique, and they feel at the same time there's this there's this torment to them where you know they've faced the elements, you know that they have been, you know, exposed for for millennia, and there's this great cultural history there as well, where you know you could be going along through the bush and happen upon some cliffs and see some of the most extraordinary rock art that you know on the planet, some of the oldest rock art on the planet as well. I mean, it's really historically significant. Some paintings that are upwards of like 50,000 years old or thereabouts, you know? And looking at this stuff, I mean, that to me was art history, just looking at it going, whoa, you know? Yeah. I'm excited for you, man. I think it's going to be incredible, you know, absolutely incredible. Congratulations. But I, I want to go back because I, I love what you said, you know, about working on the on the wharf, looking at this vessel and or, or vessels like it and going, one day I'm yeah. going to be here as a yeah. guest or I'm going to be here, not working on it, you know, but, but doing something, you know, that yeah, yeah. I'm going to belong here. I love that. I love that. Oh man. It was a funny, uh, and another moment I had, and I think it was this, almost the same day where the, the wharf boss came up and he was about to fire what I thought fire me. I remember going, all I like doing is drawing and painting while well, drawing as a kid. And I hated working, like just doing jobs around the house and what I did enjoy doing was spraying a hose like spraying <laughs> like spraying leaves around this hose and I thought one day I want to get paid a stupid amount of money to to spray a hose you know that was my thought as an eight-year-old and then fast forward to age 25 I'm in a wash bait and we have to spray trucks and I was getting paid an <laughs> amount of money I was, I was like oh that that worked out 
But at that point, I was just walk, drawing people, spraying the trucks, you know. But yeah. yeah, sometimes you just know things, and you just think, well, you know, it's going to happen, and you got to do everything you can to make it happen. If you had the opportunity to go back, and you would say something, what what would you tell Jacob Butler as a twelve year old? Oh, I'd I'd say it. I'd say the same thing every day. Go easy on yourself. And uh, and just keep following your passion, keep keep following your dream, because at the time it was uh, my drawings weren't good enough, because otherwise people would have told me to be an artist is what I thought, and there's no money in it, and you know I just listen to other people, but if you I think if you're easy on yourself, then mm. you you give yourself the time to grow, but if you're if you that internal dialogue in your head is just if it if it stops you at every every crossroad, then it's a really hard path, which is what I went through. Mm. Um, no, nobody really knows, you know, what, what your passion is but yourself. Like people can think they know, but no one really knows but yourself. So you just got to really listen to yourself mm. and, be, and, and be at ease with yourself. And if you've got a crazy dream, then you got to go for it. And yeah. if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's the, it's the oldest saying in the book really. But, yeah, I think – I think I was just really hard on myself, and I still am, you know, with paintings and everything. But um, yeah. you know, you only live one life. You just gotta just do what makes you happy. Yeah. You know, some of my students um, will be listening to this. I, I love each and every one of them. I mean that, um, and I hope they don't take offense to, to what I'm about to say. But I, when I started teaching workshops back in Perth. Um, you were the youngest that ever came to a workshop. Do you know that? Yeah, no, I noticed that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. Um, and I think I even, uh, I even said to you on the day I, I was sitting outside, uh, have, maybe having a coffee or something before I went in, and you're like, "Hey, I'm Jake." Because I, I don't know, you know, people sign up, or people are calling or emailing in. They'd sign up for the workshop, and I didn't know who was who. And so when you introduce yourself, yeah. I'm like, "Oh, okay, cool, wow, uh, welcome." You know, let, let's hang out for a bit, bro, because I'm about to go in there. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the, the thing is, though, you know, I, I, this is the thing that strikes me about the way we do, human beings do life that I just find so confusing. And I get it. Like, it's, it's, it's different for everybody. And it's, it's really hard for some people. It's a really difficult thing. Um, it, it, and it's never easy. But one of the things that struck me is the people that were in my workshops were all, without a, without a doubt, with only a, only a couple of exceptions, they were all retired or they yeah. were nearing, but they were much older in their life. And they'd either hit life a life circumstance where they had some money to be able to dedicate to their art or time. Um, where they had had, you know, long, maybe fulfilling careers, you know, doing, but now they had a chance to really do something. And the amount of comments even that I'm getting now from people on YouTube and, and emails from people going, hey, you know what? After so many years, I'm picking up the brushes again. I'm really inspired. I'm, I'm going to go for it. And, and hearing people as well in that classroom going, no, now I'm going to be an artist because now I can. Now I can give myself permission. Yeah. Does it, did it ever strike you as odd as to why more people didn't just go for it? Didn't just like... Just, I mean, for me, I'm crazy. Like, I, I, I must be like so, something. I think was was missing because uh, I, <laughs> I had lots of people telling me, "You can't. You're going to starve. You're going to fail." All blah blah blah. All, all of the usual stuff that we all hear, right? But uh, my only response to that was, "Watch me. You know, just yeah. watch me. Uh, you know, whatever you, yeah, you know, whatever you think. Okay, whatever. Watch me. Um, yeah. You know." Does it ever strike you as a bit as a bit strange as to why why is that the case? Why aren't more people out there doing it? Oh, it's crazy, isn't it? I think even with um, Instagram and everybody's fanatic about creating something new, the easiest path is to just pick up a camera. Mm. Um, and people think it's such a foreign thing to be able to draw and paint, like it's just out of their paradigm. Um, like I remember reading this a bit of a book drawing on the left side of the brain. There was a study done. Uh, yeah. Don't quote me on it, but it was like everybody's got the ability of, say, like a nine-year-old because they draw in symbols, mm -hmm. and it's only that person who actually spends like one extra week or whatever it is, a few extra days, and, realize, and makes the transition from symbols into observation. 
and that's all it takes it's like one little wire in your brain to learn you know but yeah yeah um people just don't like to i think there's this preconceived notion that you have to be talented as well like you have to be born with it Mm. but Mm. you know you can you can learn every anyone can learn anything i think that obsession is you know helps helps along the way as well but yeah yeah uh, yeah no every every comment i get when i paint is i can only draw stick figures oh my goodness all the time dude yeah every, every, yeah, yeah. Every time. <laughs> yeah no it, it's i for me it's either i i i i can only draw stick figures or i couldn't even draw a stick figure or yeah my mum paints or my dad paints, but I, I didn't get any of that, you know, any of that, those yeah. genes or whatever. And, and people feel like it is, yeah, a really foreign thing. But, you know, yeah. what you're saying about the brain, you know, or, or that, that study, I, I remember that. Like, I, it's been many years since I've, I've looked at that book. But um, essentially, all, all we have up here upstairs is, is, a, is a mess of neurons that are connected and, fi- and synapses are firing. And it's literally just building a new pathway in your brain and then strengthening those pathways. And what really fascinated me about teaching was learning how many different modes people had for finding their creativity or being able to express themselves. Um, I'll never forget, there was one, uh, an engineer in one of my classes, and he was right next to somebody who would have been a, a flower child of the 60s, you know, <laughs> and uh, somebody who was very airy-fairy and just really, you know, loose with her with her brushes and just wanted to express herself through her inner child. And, and it was very much like this. And the other yeah. guy, like, uh, and, and very flamboyant with the brushwork and the color. Just, I was like, okay, yeah. you go for it. You're having fun, no worries. <laughs> but this other guy yeah. was like locking in and he was really struggling with this thing, you know? And and I, I remember talking to him and just saying, you know, what, what do you do? What do you do? What, what did you do? What do you do for He said, Oh, I'm an, I'm an engineer. I was like, Oh, well, if you're an engineer, then you're all about like universal laws and maths and, and rigid, rigid principles. And he's like, yeah, I, I kind of, I kind of think like that, you know, and this is going back a, a few years, but, um, I just said, what well, did you know? There's only rigid laws and principles that are dictating painting. You know, if I mix a precise amount of this with this, I'm going to get this. And that if I, if I have my lines just here and here, it's going to converge on the horizon like this. Can you, and suddenly like, it's like it clicked for him in that moment. But um, I I think, I think a big thing that would help a lot of people is just realizing, you know, maybe being a a little bit easier on themselves. Like like you say, you know, you know, know, go, go easy on yourself. Definitely don't give yourself such a hard time. Try and work out that mode that you're, you're creating within and try yeah, yeah. and try and figure out how you can take what you're already built to do and expand on that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like that's a big thing I sort of struggle with uh, at the moment. Well, I'm sort of getting there, but the last three years, I've you know I've painted murals and um, huge paintings, small paintings, oils, pastels, chalk, and what happens is you start to draw like the photo. And you'll reach a point where all of a sudden you've lost it and you've just done a reproduction. It may as well just be a photo. So the hard part, I think the important part is that you have to retain your own voice and your own style of painting. Mm. And a lot of people don't realize is that even their, what they think is a crappy little drawing, if they can do that crappy little style consistency, then that's awesome because that's an original thought, an original pattern that no one else can reproduce because it's actually, you know, like everything was a, a, a sincere brushstroke. Um, so Hmm. if you've got a weird, well, a a weird style of drawing, then you should pursue that because you'll get really good and you'll be able to paint like a photo, but that's not really gonna, you'll sort of reach that end where you're like, hang on now, I've just lost, I've lost my style again. So, Hmm. uh, you you may as well just paint like you do from the, from the get go and then just learn. I just find different styles or realism or whatnot, or using different mediums as like a, like learning a, a new note on a, on an instrument you know all you're doing is playing a song and if you can learn these different notes and play in a different way that's fine but the important thing is that you're doing your original style like you're coming from within look do you mind i i, I want to get a little bit personal with you here because there's a few people and, and i think people get it i mean it's awesome hearing your story and, and how you started but i want to know i hope you don't mind me asking 
a little bit more about how your business works. Because if there's yeah. one thing I get emailed about a lot, it's, you know, how do I quit my lousy job and make a living doing something that I love? Now, I've got a particular way of doing it. Your way is different, and I love that. And, and for every artist out there, there seems to be a unique approach to making money as an artist. And hopefully after a while, we begin to, to shatter this belief, this limit, limiting belief that artists are going to starve to death. You know, artists don't make any money. Artists shouldn't make any money. You know, they, and just on that note as well, like I had people and I still have people sometimes in the comment section, but I had people even at university. And if you're commercial, if you sell your work, if you're deriving an income from your creative passion, then it's not true creativity. It's not authentic expression. And therefore, it's not valid as art. To yeah. me, that's just ridiculous. Because I, I'm... I'm happy. I'm fulfilled. I think I'm an artist. I don't give a stuff what anybody thinks. I'm just here doing my thing, sharing it with others. If they love it, great. If they don't, great, whatever. But, you know, you're, again, you're doing your dance your way and you've, you've got this, this approach. How, tell me a little bit about how you make this work as a business or, you know, in, in just as little or as much detail as you want, because I, I'm just curious about, yeah, yeah, you're, sure. you're, you're making money and now you're, you're full time. You don't have to go to the wharf anymore. You don't have to hose off a truck or draw on a helmet. I mean, even though that sounds like it's pretty cool, but you, you, <laughs> you're doing something now that is something you're passionate about and you love. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, oh man, it's crazy. Especially when I'm doing, a painting like I'm doing a, a mural that's 20 meters long and I've been because the sun shines bright I have to do it at 4 a.m. in the morning 11 p.m. till 4 a.m. in the morning with a spotlight that's the only time I can do it sometimes during the day I'll be there and I'll get a, a passerby walk by as I'm finishing the mural and go oh so do you do this for free like could you do my backyard you know there's this and you, your brain just explodes you know um <laughs> Yeah, for some reason, people think that it's like a, like it's the world's privilege to get to get their art, you know, to, to give your art, which makes it hard pricing things. And I've always had a big issue with pricing things, so I started off asking other people um, what they thought it was worth. Well, people that I trusted, like Anne, for example, because she had a photography business. Hmm. So I'll, I'll try and stay brief. But I started off doing helmets, and I was doing them for free because I knew I was already getting paid on the wharf. And I thought that if I did enough helmets, people were going to start offering me, me money. So I started painting. I did one for a guy who was in a gang, and then I did one for the biggest football player, and then I did one for the biggest part of that crew and that crew. And I was doing them for all the, the sort of influential guys on the wharf, and it trickled down. Everyone wanted one all of a sudden, and I didn't have enough time to do them. So now all of a sudden my time's valuable. So somebody offered me 50 bucks. And I was like, all right, if you're giving it to me. And all of a sudden, there was a price in the helmet. Um, it became, after, after I realized that it takes three hours to paint a helmet, that there wasn't much point in doing it. But I still enjoyed it when it came to doing a painting. To me, it was just whatever I thought was what I'd pay for it. You know, what, what would I pay for a painting like that? So I started mm. off because I'm like uh, hard on myself. I, I did them for quite cheap. But. It just meant that I had a lot of work on. So as long as I was painting, I was happy. But then when it turned into now um, now sort of need to make a living, I got asked to, to do a painting at a ball where, where there was all these people in the room and it was to raise money for heart kids, for kids with uh, congenital heart disease. And yeah. I, did a, I did a painting and somebody bought it for 2400 bucks. And this was really early on. And I was thinking, wow, all of a sudden I can – my time is sort of worth that, yeah. You know, and yeah. it, it didn't mean that I started charging charging two thousand four hundred bucks, but it just meant that um, that I could have, you know. But I wasn't comfortable doing that, so I still worked myself up to a level, um, and started doing. Uh, the first thing was an exhibition that I did, and after doing so many balls, some went for five thousand five hundred bucks. The biggest painting, I, the best painting I did recently was for. Somebody bought it for eleven thousand five hundred bucks, and it took me three hours. So once again, you're just like, "Wow!" You know, in the right moment and the, the right people, people are going to spend a lot of money. Wow. So then it just the it that money went to telethon, by the way. But yeah, yeah, it yeah. Just, 
when people start to actually pay you for what you think you're worth, then all of a sudden your work is better and you start to get the confidence behind you because you're like, well, yeah, yeah. that's right. And you finally caught on. Now I'm going to push myself to another level and another level. So, yeah, it didn't take me long to realize that I should actually start charging, um, you know, what I'm worth. And when I started, so I wouldn't really – I did quite a lot of commissions, but really I was working on my own stuff, and I still am. I've still got about 60 or 70 paintings in there as practice pieces that I'm, I'm not really, you know, mm. I don't think are ready to be released. But when this wedding business came about, it was the same thing with the helmets. I just thought, well, I just really want to, um, I just really want people to hire me because it's mm. fun for me. Mm. Um, I know it's something new, but I, I don't think it's going to catch on catch on unless a lot of people do it then I've got enough photos and I started doing it for a thousand bucks because I was like man it's a thousand bucks you know for a day um and I know that with wedding photography people are charging up to 10 grand for a day even though it's yeah it's just just a different market yeah so all of a sudden I was inundated and flying around flew to New Zealand and did one um but it was great and and enjoying myself yeah yeah, but But then I sort of thought, well, hang on. No, I sort of need to keep putting the price up. And that's yeah. sort of what I've been doing ever since. Every six months I put the price up. Yeah. Um, I'm at the stage now where I've, I've got way too much work. I was always explaining, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I paint 24-7. I, I can't remember the last time I had a day off. So I need to find that balance again. But yeah. Yeah. now I know that, that really it's your time is your greatest asset. Because I'm turning down um, huge painting, well, not turning down, but putting on hold these massive opportunities because I need to finish yeah. other work first. Yeah. So it, it was just I created my own little, um, I guess, my own little timeline of where I wanted to be and just slowly increased mm. um, the price. And then you realize, well, people are not going to, every time I put the price up, people, people go for it. So yeah. I just thought I never wanted to turn this into a business yeah. uh, like where it was all about money. I'd rather do the painting first and then sort of grow as my value went up and course, just did it. Of course, of course. I remember doing the helmets. Everyone was going, nah, you should charge 100 bucks, charge 150 bucks. Yeah, yeah. So thinking, nah, that's not the point. Like, I'm enjoying myself without, yeah. if I'm doing this on my own terms and there's no restrictions, they take it or leave it and then mm. I can get the work out there. But mm. following that model, I could, I, well, look, I don't have a problem with money at the moment. I, I've got a, I've got endless commissions and stuff to do, but I think it was just the the way I developed. It was never trying to be selfish and pocket cash. It was more about yeah. watching my val my art develop as my value went up, and yeah. just yeah. kept that kept that integrity. Do you, Do you know what it is for me? I my first goal when I when I started out was let me just make enough income so that I could keep the gig going, just yeah. as long as possible. Let me just keep painting. Because yeah, anything that if I'm like, damn it, I got to go and get a job, then suddenly that just broke the flow. And, and now I'm in a place where it's not working. The plan's not working. So as long as I can just keep this thing going, that was my first goal. And now, you know, as I'm kind of developing my business here in New Zealand and, you know, building my client list and, and commissions here, um, most of that goes just straight back into the business. And I keep keep yeah. going from there. But, you know, I have this kind of this joke with with my wife because I, I work seven days, you know, and I remember, yeah. you know, I, I when I was talking to Cesar Santos as well, like that guy works every day. I'm, yeah, one, I'm yeah. one of these guys that works every day, you know, and 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 I realized as well, like even if you're not working necessarily at the easel, I got my camera right here or I'm going to see somebody and it's going to be art related or I'm going to be immersed in the landscape where I'm going to have the next idea. I'm always up here working, you know, and yeah. you just can't switch off, but yeah. that's the life of an artist. And I think, you know, valuing yourself in that way by, by saying, no, no, this is, this is what I'm worth. Suddenly it all comes back in towards you. It's like the universe saying, I hope people don't mind me saying that because like, Andrew, you're such a hippie. No, but it's like it's like life. It's the universe telling you, hey, Jacob, you know what? Good job. Good job, brother. Keep going. Keep doing what yeah. you're doing. We, we want more of you. Keep going. Um, and, and for me as well, like uh, it's, it's, it's enormously validating. Absolutely. 
I think, and I think really, you know, this is what we're here for. I, th- I really believe that no human life is wasted. And those passions and those dreams, those, those things that we express as children, and because I, I believe that there's a certain point where you know deep down what you really want to do. And the people that I found by and large that say, oh, I don't know what I'd really love. They're afraid to say what they would really love to do because it's just yeah. ridiculous. But find examples, man, of people that are out there doing it. And this is my, my vision for the podcast is to find as many examples as I can of people that are out there doing it so that more and more of the next generation coming up and even people who are retired as well can go, I can do it. I can do it. They can do it. I can do it. You know? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're an inspiration, man. But Hey, look, let, let's, let's, but before we run out of time here, I want to get to, uh, to one last thing that we were talking about before we, we started the call. Um, another opportunity that you, you had come up recently. I wondered, may, wondered maybe if you could tell me about your experience because you went in to a maximum security prison to give a painting workshop. Yeah, that's it. Tell um, me about that. So I guess quick, quickly before I, when I finished the wharf job, I thought mm. straight away, I got off of this job working with people with disabilities uh, who have been abused or uh, were just so incapacitated or in a wheelchair or whatever it was, mm. like really suffering people. And um, I I could connect with them a whole lot better than most people, I think, for starters, because they looked at me like I was weird because when I'm explaining things um, to people, my hands shake. So they're like, oh, you know, something's wrong with you. And... Uh, and my name was shaking. My thing is about just embracing it. You know, people know that you've, if you've got something up with you, then let it out and enjoy it. You know, it's funny. For me, it was. Or for me, it is. And I started doing workshops where I'd just, the whole idea was to just get people to paint. Um, and I'd sort of set out the drawing and then just give them the right tools. Like if, if somebody had uh, this one this one person had a birth defect. He only had two fingers, so he could only pick up a brush like that. And I was thinking, well, if you can, um, if I can put the brush in there, and if he can just do that upward action, then all of a sudden he's painting trees with a roller. So I was sort of using them as like, almost sort of like like orchestrating a painting, and yeah. you could just see their faces light up, um, just like as as I would do when I learned that I could paint. To me, it was just. It, it changed my life because it, I think people underestimate how much confidence it can give you as a person um, because all of a sudden you can do something that other people can't, but you're actually creating something. So you're proud of what you're doing every day hmm. and, and you're sort of looking for that next adventure. So to, so my mission was to impart that onto these people who didn't have much because they're disabled. And I've been doing that for since I started about five years ago. And then I – yeah, and there was huge, huge results. Like people who would barely talk because they'd been abused and had, you know, so, someone has cerebral palsy, and they're not very mobile. But you give them, or you walk them through a painting, and you get them to do something. Then it just gives them, it g- gives them a reason to wake up, you know, and feel happy because they're excited about creating. So when I got this offer to work at the prison, I thought, well. I don't want to know what they're in for. I know it's bad because it's maximum security, but there's, I think, paintings for everyone. And if I could inspire a prisoner to to sort of pursue artwork, if, if that's what they're interested in because they signed up, then I could potentially change their life as well. So, um, so it's funny because when you go to the prison, they say that you do this big, um, they put you through this, room like an induction process and they say um it's all about grooming all the prisoners do is they want to manipulate you because they got nothing else to do they sort of walk up and down a yard and they think about how they can control people and they'll try and get some you know they'll try and get you to do something for them so they said don't don't talk about yourself at all don't talk about your history and don't don't touch them because they said yeah they're not they're not fussy they might take an attraction to you as well so the first day, I uh, did a presentation and told them everything about myself and shook every one of their hands. <laughs> <laughs> I 
like I, I, I grew a bit of facial hair as well. I grew like a bit of like I had my old wolf beard back and sort of, you know, I just wanted to be like them, you know, like one of the, one of the boys like them. And, um, yeah, just, just on my first presentation while I was after my presentation, while I was, um, teaching them how to paint, my hands were shaking, paint was flicking everywhere. Some guy picked up a paintbrush halfway through. He's like, here you go. Here you go, shaky, like because I was dropping things. Like they were literally getting up and helping me do the whole pro- process. Wow! And this this guy got so excited. This guy uh, Henry, he was like, he really liked my artwork because I was drawing. I did this picture of Nicky Winmar, yep. who's a AFL footy player, and he was, it was basically this famous scene where he was showing the color of his skin. And he's like, uh, I really love your art. And I go, Why is that? And he goes, Oh, because Nicky Winmar's my cousin. And I was like, All oh, right, okay. <laughs> Um, so he, um, through the next day, he, he barred through the door, uh, while I was giving presentation he's like, Hey Shane, you got some lasagna for you. And he basically cooked me up some lasagna and, and gave it to me. So I was eating it while I was um, giving the presentation. Like it was just amazing to see how much they just like how important art was yeah. to them. You know, yeah. it was like a, it was like an eight year old giving an apple to a teacher, but it was in lasagna. Um, and the, the thing was, what I noticed is that they, um, for starters, they always, they just asked me the same question, like, do you think I'm good? Really? Do you think I can do it? Really? And it was like, nobody had ever told them they're in there for a bad reason, but I, I imagine a lot of it's upbringing. And it's like, nobody had ever told them that, that they were good. Yeah. You know, that they could, and I thought my whole purpose was to just say, Give it a go because you know it can change your life. It can give you a reason to get up, to sort of self improve, and uh, and really pursue something. Yeah. And a lot of them did. A lot of them actually do university art degrees in there. And when they're on the outside, they can start you know become painters. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, some of the guys were in there because they are into tattooing and they tattoo. Uh, they tattoo each other in prison. So I was giving them like valuable skills and they're like, you know, they can make money out of it. So whatever it was, there's, you know, I thought, I thought, you know, people like that do need, they do need the influence of art in their life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wow, that's extraordinary. I mean, giving, you know, all judgments aside, giving somebody that opportunity to express their creativity, that's, um, that's really important for human beings, I think. What, oh, what yeah, are, absolutely. Yeah. What, a, what an incredible experience. Yeah, no, and then I got offered a tutor job to, to go back, but I, I don't have enough time. I'd probably go in for different workshops, but yeah, it was funny. I was teaching these two guys. They came in late and, um, I was teaching him how to do my thing and this guy's looking at me and he's got a tattoo on his face. I don't know what it said, rat's tail. And he's like, you're really shaking, eh, boy? And I'm like, yeah, my name's Shaky. People think I'm disabled. And like everyone just started cracking up, you know, like it was just so funny. Like yeah. just that whole thing as well. If I didn't address my tremor as well and if I could just level yeah. with him, then it could have gone the, the wrong way. But it was all yeah. just being open. I think it's just an painting and learning like that environment it's just an honest thing and everyone's on the same terms you know so so you you've had uh, you've had that tremor since since birth since dot do you think that embracing that you know how has that affected your art like by just going yeah. with it by just owning this thing and saying yeah g'day my name's shaky like by just owning it has that had some flow on effect with your art career Oh yeah, big big time because it's it's not so much that it, you know it goes on and off. So it's not so much that I that I can't paint as fine as people. Like it, it takes a bit longer, but it was just the whole act of never worrying about if I'm making a mistake. Yeah. So when I paint, I don't use a grid line and and I just do it by eye. And the more wrong strokes I make, the more I can zero into the right area. If you know what I mean. So yeah. as loose as possible. And if your hands are shaking or if you've got that nervous energy and you, if you can get it out there, then you can basically go with that flow. And I always tell people, just don't worry about your mistakes. That's what painting's for. You go over it. You know, it's mm. a building game. It's not a, it's not a rubbing out game. Yeah, for sure. Look, this, is, um, this has been really inspiring, Jacob. This has been fantastic. <laughs> um, 
Look, maybe before we wrap things up, is there anything you want to kind of leave with people, anybody who's up and coming, maybe listening to this, any any message that you have for them? I, I didn't really have, didn't really think of that, but I, th- I think what I just try and, um, what happened to me was just when you, when you really do take that step, and go, no, this is what I want to do, like your life will open up. And as you mentioned, the universe does provide. Like the first day, I swear to God, the first day I um, I decided I want to be an artist, the first day I was sacked on site and I was at the new house, I looked up on Gumtree and I thought, I want to get a paint kit. And I found this specific, it was these pit pens that yeah. I was using to sketch and nobody sells 300 pit pens. You buy them individually and this guy was selling 300 pit pens wow. per daughter and I was like that's weird so I called the guy up and he goes yeah they're actually my partners who just passed away uh, he's got a whole studio and you can take it all if you want and he wow. basically wanted to give it to me I went there and I filled up a whole table with everything in my whole everything I ever wanted oil paints brushes like there was this weird projector thing um drafting thing everything you can name like you wouldn't believe it and uh and I just and I said, "Is a thousand bucks all right?" No, he offered a thousand bucks, and I was like, "Yep." And it was just that was the first day, and I was like, "You know, it's wow. a true thing. I'm, there's, there's no looking back, and that will happen. You just got to look for the signs, you know. Like you got to follow your intuition, and just um, and just have faith in yourself because there's only one way, you know. And the universe will provide it. Well. Tell people out there where they can find you, your Instagram, website, if you got it, Facebook, all that good stuff. Uh, Yeah, if you go on Facebook, go and uh, look up shaky.com.au. And then on Instagram, it's at shakyjakey11. And then my website's www.shaky.com.au. And um, yeah, follow me there. I'm always about three months behind what I post because I want to paint first before I post, but Sure. Yeah, I've got a really exciting year ahead, and based on this Kimberley trip uh, on the True North, that's when I'm. Re- to me, that's that's the time to really start producing my original artworks, and it'll turn into an exhibition. So, make sure you get in contact to uh, to check it out. Fantastic! I, I for one really look forward to seeing more of your work. I'm really excited to see where you go over the next few years. Um, you know, you've got a level of energy and enthusiasm and passion that is is just about unmatched. I mean, I can hear it and uh, I'm just really excited for you, mate. So thank you so much for being part of the podcast. Oh, no, thanks very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Now, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Creative Endeavor podcast and a big thank you to Jacob Butler for joining me. I've included a couple of links to his work so you can check out more of what he does by clicking those links in the description down below. I've provided a link to his website as well as his Instagram page. Now, if you liked this episode and you want to see more podcasts just like this one, then make sure you click that like button and leave me a comment down below. If you want to see some of my painting videos, then make sure you're subscribed to this channel. As always, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook, but most important, make sure you're subscribed through my website at andrewtischler.com. Thanks so much for stopping by. I'll see you again soon.